Um, so I'm Danielle Lomberg, and I'm at the California Digital Library, um, and I'm also working as a product manager for Dryad. Uh, my name is John Chidaki. I also work at California Digital Library, and we are in one of the programs there at CDL that we call UC3, um, the University of California Curation Center, that's focused on uh, data and preservation topics. Um, we, I know in the book it says that we're talking about CDL and Dryad today and the partnership that we've entered, but we wanted to bring it back and kind of talk about the story of why CDL has even entered into this partnership and where we've been in the last year in regards to data publishing and our values there. Uh, so we want to start off and talk about a little bit of a self-assessment that we've been doing in the last year. Um, so last year at CNI, um, I was here talking about data publishing and adoption um, and where the adoption was because we're spending time all talking about this, but we weren't really seeing adoption at the institutional level. Is that something that you guys are involved in? How many of you guys are involved in data services specifically at the institution? A lot, yeah. How many people were here last year at CNI? Did, did any of you see the talk that we did last year? Yeah, <gasps> yeah. yeah nice. <laughs> Shout out. Um, so uh, this was specifically uh, looking at what the researcher needs are and if we were aligned or misaligned with the, what we're talking about here in the CNI community and larger in the research stakeholder community. Um, and what we learned are a couple things here is that tools that we're talking about a lot aren't really researcher centric. So we're not really using the researcher as the main point when we're building out these tools. Um, and that sometimes when we're thinking about this community, we're thinking about what are best practices for us, but that can be misaligned with what a researcher's values actually are. Um, another point about that is that when we're focusing on tools and talking about these technology communities and which ones we align with, Sometimes that's distracting us from actually talking to researchers and figuring out what their needs are and then driving the adoption and figuring out what makes sense for them. Um, but a big one that, that came out of this is we ourselves had a data publishing platform at UC called Dash and that was for all of the University of California. And when I would go talk to researchers there and say, you should deposit to Dash, we have all these cool features, you should do it. Um, they would always say, oh, well, I'm just gonna go to Figshare or Dryad. Is that okay? And my response is always, yeah, because I just want you to publish your data. But what we recognized is that researchers are not driven by institutional policies, especially because a lot don't have data policies. Um, but researchers think at the domain level. What are my collaborators doing? Not specifically to, I'm gonna publish my data in this UC place and my collaborator in Germany is just gonna be involved in that. Um, and so the biggest takeaway that we found is that we have to meet researchers where they're at within their workflows. And the biggest one we know right now is that researchers are driven by article publishing. And so we tried to go to all of the big journals saying, integrate with Dash, UC is a massive institution, then we can have it within the workflows. And that's not sustainable, right? Publishers aren't gonna think specifically at the institutional level as well. So we wanted to look um, specifically at our own success metrics. We were thinking, okay, so we've been working on Dash for a while. We spend a lot of resources here talking about data publishing at the UC campuses. Let's look at a couple of success metrics. One, number of deposits. So over maybe the five years that we had Dash going, we had about 500 deposits, which in the scheme of things is nothing compared to what's coming out of UC. Is that a problem that you guys, does anyone have more than 500 at their institutional? How many, how many people that run data repositories have over 500 deposits <coughs> in, their, in, in their repository? So we, it's, this is like you know, the, the, the um, little secret of like all the resources we're putting into these projects is that the adoption, the number, I mean we know there's quality over quantity of course, but the number, the scale of what we're getting when it comes to adoption is very, very small at all of our institutions. Very, very small. So at UC, we were saying, even with 500 deposits, that's just not enough. It's still just a drop in the bucket. So then we were like, okay, well not deposits, maybe it starts with awareness, and then we'll see deposits down the line. We go around to the campuses, we talk about this, awareness is a problem, and it's not without trying, because so many libraries were involved in supporting us. I'm looking at Elizabeth from Santa Cruz, who their staff had been trying for many years for adoption of this as well, 
And it's just, again, coming back to that the researchers were not looking at the institution. They already had their domain or were already involved in Figshare in another, another way. Um, the next integration into workflows, like I said, we went to publishers and said, let's do this. We went to Jupyter Notebooks. We said, let's get into that realm. Um, and they said, that's a really great idea. And UC is a massive institution, but we're not going to do that at an institutional level. Um, and so, you know, at that point, if we can't make it easier for researchers, then we were saying we did not succeed. Um, and lastly, the kind of wraps it together is that we couldn't really come up with a good story for the value proposition at that point. Researchers were not adopting it. Researchers didn't see that there was a clear value over going where their collaborators would go. Um, we weren't making, we could put in new features, but we weren't getting any integrations that were going to significantly lower the barrier to entry. Um, and so all this wasn't without trying, um, but we just didn't feel like we were really successful and we had to be honest about that. All the while that we're doing this, commercialization has rapidly entered the research data space. Here's a couple examples here um, uh, that we may be aware of, Springer Nature, Figshare, Mendeley Data. Specifically, you know, these costs are just not affordable. Um, we know that Springer Nature now says $340 for a data set just to, to go through a couple manual checks of the data set. Um, and this is still maybe lower quality than all of us are offering at our institutions and still not even in line with institutional values. But we also know that researchers are going there. Uh, researchers go where the publishers are telling them to go. Um, and we know that all of these uh, big services coming out are pretty unaffordable with library budgets. Um, <coughs> aside from all of that, we as a community at the same time right now, we have a colleague talking about community infrastructure for articles and the commercialization in the article space. All of that is happening and we're all heavily invested in that area. But if we don't focus on data, we're going to face the same problem that we're talking about for articles for data, and it's <coughs> going to happen really soon. So all of this is an issue that we had to take into consideration. So we, we also um, wanted to think about the, 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 um, the framing of this as a community issue and thinking about what is needed from our community um, in the libraries, within the researcher space, within the research data space, and really thinking about um, best practices. So uh, how many people here have read the um, Principles for Open Scholarly Infrastructure article? Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's a pretty influential article that came out by Jennifer Lynn, Jeff Builder, and Cameron Nalen. Um, just laying out some of the principles of, of good scholarly infrastructure projects to showcase what would be needed for us to, as a community to be able to trust and have a good interaction <coughs> with infrastructure projects and know that they were keeping the community in mind. Um, their, their premise is this three-legged stool idea of governance, sustainability, and insurance. So governance making sure that community projects are thought of um, and are uh, architected by the community, are led by the community, um, and they have very specific ideas around how we should be um, enforcing those types of governance models within our infrastructure projects that we support. Um, sustainability, we need to know where the money is coming from and what the, and, and, and strive not just for finding um, projects that are not for profit or um, kind of blanket terms like that, but actually digging a little deeper and saying, how does the project that or, or work that we are um, relying on within these, within these um, scholarly pro infrastructure projects, how are they um, going to be there uh, long term? How, explain it to me, show me the numbers, and also don't be, a, don't be scared of you know, running, uh, being able to make a little extra money for innovation investment. Don't, don't force people to starve their projects. You know, allow for there to be sustainability and innovation within um, scholarly infrastructure <coughs> projects. Also, the idea around in insurance, insurance that the, the project will be there, that the assets that we're, they're working on with us are going to be there. And these are all um, principles that you know, are, are thought of to span um, all of the infrastructure projects that are within SCALCOMS. And are, they are uh, you know, things that we in the library world already espouse to and already are committed to. But it's good. It's a good re a good evaluation of the kind of what kind of projects we should be as a community here investing in, and what their responsibilities are to us. Um, kind of separate from that, but in parallel to that, a group of people, including myself, got together and thought, okay, we're talking a lot about infrastructure as technology, but we're not talking a lot about the people. So 
you know, the, the challenge that we have in a lot of infrastructure projects that we get involved in or community projects that we get involved in, that we're, we're not aligned at a people level. Like they're, they're great projects, but they're just not our people. And so we started to say, wow, well, what does that mean? What is this kind of generic term of who are our people? And so we started to sit down and say, what are the best principles for um, individuals in this space? What, what, what kind of values would we want them to have so that we can understand that we have a shared value and a community, ba community based on those shared values? And so we came up with a set of six, and there's a, a book online that's supporters.guide you can read, but just about how personally we should be thinking about being as transparent as possible. Um, we should make sure that we are using open infrastructures and we are working as much as possible um, and practice what we preach. Um, we have to think about how to be transparent, not just when we're working outside of our spaces, but also within our workplaces. We have to be transparent with our colleagues. We have to be more transparent with each other about what we're doing. Um, we have to bring other people in. It's fine to have public-private or cross-organizational mm -hmm. partnerships. We have to recognize and celebrate those differences. It's not just about um, everybody working with similarly focused in people. We want to build a bigger tent. Um, and we need to respect multiple solutions, but we have to make sure that when we're working on our projects, we're sticking to our scope and we're thinking about what are we doing. You know, in our case, it's like, how are we driving adoption on data publishing? We can't boil the ocean. We have to, like, when we're working on our projects, we have to be able to stick to that scope. And leveraging communal wisdom, and it's, but, you know, uh, also encouraging healthy skepticism, but really that, you know, we're stronger when we collaborate together. And these types of um, values are what we would say bring and make good scholarly communications projects, um, open infrastructure projects possible. So, you know, our our um, our our project here, the you know the the portfolio of projects that started with Dash and, and other uh, consulting services, is really about effectively supporting the research community. So. That doesn't always mean that we would need to build something or we need to create a new tool or we have to adopt another tool. It's really about looking at what is it that are the barriers to entry? What are the barriers for researchers to, to publish their data and make it openly available? And really starting to focus more on that root problem instead of focusing so much on whether or not someone's using the right kind of markup or someone's got the right kind of database structures um, it, at, within our library IT departments, right? <coughs> And so we wanted to look outwards and say, what, is, um, what are projects that are similarly aligned, have similar ethos, are led by people within our community, are focused on being as good uh, in, as possible when it comes to best practices for open scholarship? What are places that are already growing adoption? And where are places that are meet meeting our researchers um, where they're at? And the logical choice in the place that we all know is Dryad. So we did a full evaluation of what we knew we needed to be able to, to be successful with in our data publishing um, projects at, at UC and at CDL. And we knew that Dryad was doing a better job than we were on UC campuses. So how many people know the Dryad, right? So ev everybody's researchers in, in this room publish their data within Dryad. Every, every university's researchers are downloading data sets from Dryad. Dryad is a community-run organization. It's been, for 10 years, run by researchers and with researchers. It's integrated into a journal workflows. It's, it's 450 journal workflows. It, it is currently, I'm not pushing, I'm not pushing forward on my slides, I apologize. Um, you know, over 90,000 researchers have used Dryad. We are, we're talking about adoption that's not in the hundreds or the tens. We're talking about thousands, right? We're talking about being able to meet a researcher where, where they're at so that they actually have an incentive to use a, and to publish um, data. And so uh, if, I don't know if people saw this, but in May we made an announcement that we would join forces with Dryad to really help leverage their place within our community and the value that they're already giving us in this room and in the wider community. They are already helping us with curating and, and uh, data sets. They're already helping us with making sure there's quality data sets published. They're already helping us with the awareness campaign. And they are already helping us with the adoption problems that we have in the library world and in the institutional world. 
And we said at CDL, we're going to work with Dryad to try to showcase this to the community and make sure that the whole community understands and sees this value. And so we have since May been working very closely with Dryad on. And, and the research, you know, the researcher adoption of this was a major point for us because, you know, Dryad wasn't necessarily going out to the campuses and working with the researchers and yet still maybe 12% of what's in Dryad was from UC and we got 500 within Dash. And it's just truly because of the way that they're set up, the way they're owned by the research community that we, we ourselves just can't get that embedded like someone that's already bought in like this. And so that was a big driver of, okay, the values align, but also it's just already something that our researchers want. Right, so we um, have been working since May, excuse me, to, um, to launch a new Dryad that is um, moved onto a platform that can be more API based so we can accelerate even more integrations with more publishers. We've been working across the teams to look at um, ways of uh, repositioning the community value statements that are made around Dryad to showcase the kind of work that they're already doing with researchers across the world. Um, and allowing for more integrations with publishers, but also more um, integrations with kind of things that we value within the institutional space, right? So more, more reporting for, uh, for institutions and more transparency for you and for your libraries and for institutions into what's going on within Dryad. Um, and part of that is a membership model. So back to that kind of idea of governance. So Dryad is a member-led uh, membership organization right now, but there aren't very many institutions who actually pay into Dryad as members, right? We're leveraging them, we are using them, they are helping with the adoption problem that we have within our communities, and we're, but we are not paying into that model. And so if we follow the best practices of how community projects are to work, we have to start paying in and being a part of the conversation and starting to think about how do we get our values and our ideas um, um, into this conversation and helping Dryad position itself um, as this is the community project that it is. Um, yeah, that's it. So that's kind of the background on why where we are. But thinking about that, um, working on this project now of relaunching this new Dryad service. Oh, uh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have two guiding values, and these go back to originally what we were talking about last year and what we've been thinking about all the time, which is that, one, we need to be researcher-centered. So we know that there's a lot of people that have opinions and priorities for data publishing, and our primary goal here is that the user is the researcher, and the researcher is who we need to be thinking about when we're building. So everything in Dryad um, is a user-tested, user-prioritized feature. Um, we know there's all these things out there, but it has to be that researchers would definitely use this and this would help them with publishing their data. Um, and the second point to that is that we're adoption focused. So there may be, you know, there's a lot of goals, there's a lot of needs right now. And for Dryad specifically, we are focused on curated and compliant research data publishing. So not just dropping your data that may be associated with an article or other, but specifically that these are high quality data sets that are coming out and being published and that researchers are supporting. So what does that all even look like? Um, and we know best not to do a demo, so I'm only showing some of the things from the new system. Um, but we can, of course, talk after if you have specific questions. Um, so we're moving, as John mentioned, onto a new platform. This is Dash. This was the UC platform that we had come up with. So most of these features are already ready. So when we're talking about this new platform, we're not saying in two years from now. We're saying we're ready to go. And we, we want to launch. We want community support on this. Um, so this platform is Core Trust sealed. It's standards based. Um, we are uh, discoverable, schema.org and Google dataset search. We're using ORCID for login, as well as institutional sign-ons, using funder registries, um, having keywords and making everything discoverable in that way. And then big things at the bottom here that I'm gonna go through in more detail, but um, having features that allow for easier deposit of data sets, both through the publisher and through your work environment. Having uh, institutional features that had not been there before that I'll go through. 
Um, and having actual ways to report back on what's going on with the usage of that data set. So another project that we're involved in is called Make Data Count, which you may have heard of. Um, and that's a project about standardizing data usage metrics and citations. And so the first implementation that can be seen is in this platform. But the non-technical side of this is that Dryad values curation, and that's really what makes Dryad stand out. Um, we know that institutions, we really care about curation as well. Um, and so what we're focusing on here is that curators, expert curators are actually going through every submission that's going into Dryad. Um, and in the past, it's been these uh, curators that, are, that work at Dryad, but we know a big part of this is that as institutions, we super value curation, and we have <coughs> data curators and data librarians that want to be involved in this. And so we are also building for that ability. For us to actually be a community, it means that the data librarians at the institutions are involved in these endeavors and not leaving them out. So there's four big stories here about what we're focusing on. Seamless deposits. So one thing Dryad has had is a good relationship with publishers, and we want to advance that. And so when we're talking about publisher integrations, we're saying API integrations, where when a researcher is submitting to a journal, they can automatically submit their data. And we can send back the data citation to the journal and actually have that connection back and forth. So this is something that Scholar One is building, which are major journals, Wiley, Taylor and Francis, um, made, uh, maybe most <laughs> uh, on Scholar One. We're talking to Aries and Highwire and OJS. Um, and we're going at the platform level, so not at the publisher level. So this can be a switch um, that publishers can choose because we know that the more publishers who do this, the more deposits we're going to see coming in easier for researchers. Just, do, do people know the names like the Highwire, Scholar One? Yeah, so. So, I mean, I, I would just stop and say, you know, think about the idea of your data repositories or your data strategies being, you know, would you ever even think that you could have a journal integration with uh, Scholar One? It's, your, it's just not something that would even be able, you would ever be able to do at the level of just your institution. Also, what, who could? So think about who else in this space actually could do that. Now, most of the names that you're thinking are all companies. They're all organizations that are trying to charge us lots of money for lots of stuff. So it's like, where do we all, where are we all going to go, and how are we all going to work on trying to draw, drive adoption and thinking about this level of activity, unless it's with a community-run organization like Dryad. It's going to be with these commercial en enterprises. So we have to start thinking in our head, like Danielle said earlier, where are we going to be five years from now if we don't start thinking about how we can support community-led initi initiatives like this? So. so that's the focus on ease of deposit for researchers. But another big part is transparency and reporting for institutions. Um, so another big part of this is, hey, researchers have been going, again, at probably every single one of you here that represent an institution, researchers there have been submitting to Dryad but you uh, don't have a look in, right, and that way to connect with Dryad on that. And so uh, here I'm going to show this is the new system. Uh, this is transparency and, and reporting that you can have into the system now. Um, so you would see anything that's coming in from your institution. You can search by it, you can filter, and then, of course, you can download a CSV of it. So you could actually see what's coming out of your campus and who's even started a submission, but not even clicked submit or who started one, but it's in privacy for peer review. And you could actually have your data librarians be working with them through their submission process. Um, and this is made possible through s what Daniela mentioned earlier around either ORCID login or single sign-on login from your campus's single sign-on. Right. Uh, and then another image here of a visual provenance. So not only seeing you know, what in that reporting view, but what's actually happening with the data set, what's going on with researchers at your institution, um, where are they submitting to the journal, because it'll also say what journal they're at, and just kind of get that fuller picture of what's coming out. Um, and we also wouldn't be putting grog in the comments. Or we might, but. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be s people's names, not testing account as the name. <laughs> but yes, you get the picture. Um, a big piece of this, of course, being the usability and discoverability. This is where curation comes in. Uh, so this is a dry data set that's been ported over. 
um, into the new system. Of course, it would have ORCID uh, attached to the authors. Um, but a big part of this is that we want to have a really prominent data citation. So if we're trying to say best practices, let's focus on the actual citation to this data set. Um, and then, of course, because I mentioned make data count being involved, let's see who else is citing that data set. Let's actually get a fuller picture of what the use of this data set is. Uh, going back, of course, because it's not live, the views and downloads being standardized as well. Um, so you can actually, you know, when you're pulling that report, see, oh, okay, this data set has this impact, it has this usage, um, thinking about that way. So just, I mean, just real quick around like, an another thing we as a community do a lot is we spend a lot of money on business intelligence information that should just be free, right? So one of the things that this does and what we're talking about here is being able to work together to build a corpus of information about what's happening on your campus that doesn't cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? So knowing what's going on with the data, data that's being published from your campus knowing who is citing that, knowing where that, where that, the, the reach of that uh, research output. That is something that if you think to yourself, we're all spending way too much money and way too much time on, and we don't work together on that problem. And again, another, another side benefit of working in a community-led organization or with a community uh, infrastructure uh, project like Dryad. Yep. And we also, coming back to this, if we don't act on this now and support the community, I don't know how many of you also received emails in the last week about paying about 5K for a similar report from Springer Nature, but again, it's not that we don't support people that are supporting commercial services, it's if we care about these community principles, we, we got to think about this right now. Um, and then, of course, here when I say curation, curators are actually looking at the keywords, they're actually seeing is it optimized for search. Um, are we actually referencing the article that's related to? Are we making this a usable data set? So looking at the files, making sure that they actually open and are interoperable, um, and that there's enough metadata, of course, if you're a metadata librarian, you know that you would not be pleased with it just being an abstract, but enough metadata to understand what the data set uh, would make it usable. Um, and then the last piece of this is compliance. So. Uh, we know that we as a community care about fair data, and so that is, again, what makes Dryad stand out, is actually curating data uh, to comply with what we consider as a community fair. There's funder requirements, so having the core trust seal um, on Dryad, fair data, making sure that we have proper preservation of the data that's coming in through here. Um, having publisher policies so that you can actually keep it private during peer review, but institutions would still have that view in. Um, and having it be proper data citation. So what are the best practices and how could Dryad support that? Um, and then I put your input here because for institutional values, we wanna be talking to you as a community and saying, what is it that you value and that you would want in this system? So we're adoption focused, but if, you, if we're all spending time thinking about what is the best in this space, we need the institutions to be involved um, in this place where the researchers are already going. Yeah, so if we, if we have, um a, a policy or an, a, a concept on, a, on our campuses that says we want to have a copy of every data file that comes in, then we should do that. That doesn't, you know, if, if we say we want to make sure that there's a certain set of information that's put into data sets that are, that are published, we should do that. This is like not, again, not something that would be done if we were doing it on our own or something that would be done if we were using a commercial enterprise, you know, a, a service. But something that can be done if we're thinking about it, like what are things that the inst we as institutions value? What do we want? Let's build a, the community project that can actually do that. So kind of wrapping up what sets Stride apart um, is that we're focused on the user. The goal is for curation and compliant research data publishing. Um, and that the features are actually driving adoption and upholding institutional values and bringing them in. Um, and so we, our big focus, you know, of doing this, I hope it's clear, you know, what the story is, but for also for us, it's less about Dryad being the only solution for research data, but it's more that our researchers are already going there. And so this really to us is saying we as a community should support them, um, even if it's not the one solution at your campus. Yeah, so, I mean, one thing that we've, didn't bring up, but a phrase that we've been using a lot during this is um, is uh, right-sized. So one of the challenges that we have in the data publishing space is that we are being sold or we're being told that we need to have very bloated 
uh, out of out of wrongly scoped, inappropriately scoped solutions for problems, um, and we're being told that we should be paying or we should we should uh, be charged inappropriately sized price tags for services. You know why are, we're being asked to pay five thousand dollars to get a report for stuff that came from our university. We're trying. We're being paid. We're being asked to pay three hundred fifty dollars for someone to curate a data set when we have data curators on campuses. We're being asked to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for data repository support, or t for someone to come in and, or we ourselves are assuming that we must pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to support a data repository on campuses. And so one of the things that we're talking about here is like, what is the value? What is the monetary value of what we're putting into these things? And what are the what is the value that we're getting out of Dryad right now? And thinking about what is the right-sized approach of like what are we as an or, uh, as a community thinking that we should be you know paying into Dryad? What's a, what's an appropriate price tag for this? Is it a few thousand dollars a year? Is it um, donating in time and energy to do data curation on the platform? Is it what it, what is that value? What is it that we as a community would would put back into the project? And so I mean we are already an institutional community, and we already support data curation, data publishing, data preservation. Um, and it's really this call to action of banding together. Um, and so we at CDL have started to um, band together with Dryad. And I think what we're talking about here is a call to action to the community to say, we should start talking about how we can become members of Dryad. We should start signing up. We should start thinking about how we can be involved in the, in the governance in the future of the organization. So the next one. Yeah. You want to see? Yeah, and you know, relating back to what uh, originally um, I had written about and presented about last year was it's not about technology. This we just showed some technology, but that's not really the focus in this. It's not about which community are you involved in and which technology do you stand by. Um, it's just that we need to meet researchers where they're at, and we need a centralized approach to this. We need to work together and figure this out because. Uh, we already know researchers are going to go places even if we have no control over it. And so having this central approach, if we all agree here in the room that adoption is key for us, um, we got to work together. So that's our call to action. And that's our presentation. And that's it. And <laughs> so, I mean, that's it for the <laughs> presentation. So really, really what we wanted to do is spend time to be able to have a question and answer session, like to be able to respond and talk about like, you know, the, this is a conversation and a call to action for all of us. So if there were questions or ideas or comments about what we're presenting up here, it'd be great to just spend the rest of the time on that. In the back first. And so thanks everyone for coming and come talk to us if you want to talk further about connecting. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>